Um, we're doing a sermon series on a book that was written by Tom and Joni Schultz called Why Nobody Wants to Be Around Christians Anymore. Okay. And I want to just recap and then I want to pray and then we're going to get into this. Okay. Um, I just wanted to recap a few points that we went over last week and the week, the week prior. Uh, first, we were looking at a few statements that describe Jesus and his actions and Jesus and his attitudes. Like, for an example, to listen to others, to learn their stories before telling them about our faith. Or in recent years, have you influenced multiple people to consider following Jesus? Or are you personally spending time with non-believers to help them follow Jesus? See, these are some of the attitudes of Jesus. To believe that he is for everyone. That God is for everyone. Because that's Jesus the unifier. Um, or an attitude like, this, I see God working in people, even when they're not following him. Or how about this? Is it more important to help people know God or point out their sin? Now, the other statements about action and attitude represent a Pharisee's spirit. A self-righteous attitude. The reason why I'm bringing this up is I want to see where you feel you fare, where you're at. Are you more like Jesus or are you more like a Pharisee? A Pharisee's action would be, I don't talk about my sin or my struggles. That's between me and God. Believe it or not, one of the most effective ways to evangelize the word of God to someone is to show that person your frailty, to show that person your struggles. Because now they feel like, oh, wow, they're just like me. People think that Christians have this I'm perfect type attitude, and that's what repels people from them. They, have, they feel like Christians have this self-righteous attitude, like the Pharisee, because they don't share their struggles. Share your struggles with people. Let them know that you're all, we're all in the same boat. How about this? I try to avoid spending time with people who are already, who, I try to avoid spending time with people who are openly gay or lesbian. I always remember something. Because you befriend someone who has an alternative lifestyle, doesn't mean you endorse that alternative lifestyle. You can still love someone that might not share your, your belief system, your worldview. Okay? How about this? I like to point out those who do not have the right theology or doctrine. I mean, how many times Christians are divided over secondary issues most of the time that non-Christians don't even really even know about or even care about? But we're all so focused on that. It's not doing anything to bring people into the kingdom of God. Or how about this? I prefer to serve people who attend my church rather than outside people outside the church. We talked about this earlier, acts of kindness to, to non-believers, showing them Jesus' love, acting out God's love for them. That's the point. Now, the self-righteous attitude looks like this. I find it hard to be friends with people who seem to be constantly doing the wrong things. It's not our responsibility to help people who won't help themselves. How about this one? I feel grateful to be a Christian when I see other people's failures and flaws. Brutal. How about this? I believe we stand against those who oppose Christian values. And that's how outsiders see Christians, that we're always, that's what we're about. And that's not what we're about. We're about Jesus. We're about God demonstrating his love that even though we all fall short of God's glory, that Jesus died for us. That's why Paul went on to say, you'll find it'd be hard pressed to find someone to die for a righteous man. It'd be hard pressed to find a righteous man. Or how about a good man? Let alone wretched sin, wretched sin, sinners like us. That's the big idea, guys. 
But I want that to ferment a little bit. Or how about this? We have this attitude like people who follow God's rules are better than those who do not. Before I get into this, I want us to pray. Um, but I want to kind of just recap so we know where we're at. Okay? But let's pray. Father God, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name for your word. Lord, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to come and join us during this study to illuminate our minds, open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts to receive this message so that we can impact not only ourselves, but the world around us. And Lord, I wanna lift up Michelle Smith, and I pray that you send the comforter to help her during this time. She's a sister of ours, and we love her, and we want her to know this. And I also wanna lift up my brother Bill, who's here. And Lord, I pray that you heal him and restore him and give him back his strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So where do we stack up? Who are we more like? Are we like Jesus? Or are we like the Pharisees that killed Jesus? That's why I wrote on our church wall, people think religion saves. Religion doesn't save. Religion kills. Jesus saves. That's why the younger generation, they don't think what we believe in is right or true. Because they look at his religion and they see how many people religion killed over the centuries. But what did Jesus say? He will, he will live by the sword, will die by the sword. When they came to arrest Jesus, he told Peter to put the sword away. What am I, leading the rebellion? That's what he said. That's not what he was about. So we need to show the world who Jesus really is. Because we might be the only ones that ever can really show the world who Jesus really is. I mean, just to go over a few statistics with you, and then I want to get into the Bible, because the Word of God stands on its own. That's why Jesus said it. The world might be fading and ending and everything in it, but my Word stands forever because His Word's eternal. So we're going to get into the word because I want to lift you up. But I want to show you what we're look at, looking at as far as statistics of how people are looking at us so we can change that aim, change that perception. Because like I said last week, it doesn't matter if the perception is real or not. If it's real to that person, it, it's, it's real. If it's true to them, then it becomes real to them. Whether it's real or not or whether it's true or not or whether it's right or not, it doesn't really matter. It's how they're perceiving it. So let's look at that. Many people in America view Christians as judgmental and consider Christians as hypocritical. But don't let that word bring you down because everyone's a hypocrite to a certain degree. Unless you do everything you're going to say 100% of the time, you're hypocritical. So you got to understand something. The reason why I don't get offended when the world judges me because, first of all, what the world don't know is that, that and you need to know this, the world can't judge us because God already judged us when Jesus hung on the cross for us in our place for our sins. So it's like double jeopardy. We can't be tried for the same sins again. But the world don't know that. But the world's judging us for the very, the very reason they're judging us. They're, they're, they're actually ju saying that we're judgmental and judging to them, but they're doing the same thing to us. So we have to know that in order to look past that so we can love them and make them understand what it's really about. John 3.17 says, God sent his son into the world not to judge it or condemn it, but to save the world through him. We always, you know, we always want to talk about John 3.16, but John 3.17 really is a great scripture as well. Because it's saying why Jesus came. And you can just simply say it to somebody. Say, listen, Jesus came to the world not to judge the world, even though you're judging my Lord. He didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but to save it. My bigger concern is something that I read in this book that we're going through. Why nobody wants to be around Christians anymore. Um, 
it struck a nerve. And let, I'm going to share with you why. It's something I see in the church that really concerns me. And it's the reason why non-believers, when they watch us, they see this. They watch Christians work so hard trying to control everything in their lives. And let me explain why that's so important to an outsider. And you know, Mary, where I'm going with this. It's, it's as if God's not the one in control. So you're saying you believe in this all-powerful, almighty God. But you're, they're saying how we're like control freaks. We need to control everything. And we're so easily offended with the littlest offenses, as if God's not big enough to take care of himself or you. So it's not, it's not representing our faith well. And that's why they're not impressed. Think about it. When Peter was locked up in jail, he was sleeping. When Jesus was, when the storm was ready to kill the disciples and they were like, Lord, Lord, don't you care that we're dying, we're perishing? Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat. Was he worried? That's faith that needs to be exemplified from us to the world for them to take notice. That's the problem. You're saying you believe in God, but you're all freaked out about the littlest things. And that's what they're looking at. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's like Christians don't believe that God is real. If we really believed in God, then why don't we live like it? Bold, have audacious faith. To say the sun stands still, like Joshua. Joshua was about to destroy the enemy. And he needed the sun to stay up because the sun's light was blinding the enemy's eyes as he was going down to take them. And he, made, he prayed a very audacious prayer. He said, Lord, make the sun stand still. And he did. That's why short prayers are long enough. Because when you look at all the Bible, most of the prayers that moved mountains were short prayers. What did Jesus do when he fed the 5,000? He blessed it and started handing it out. They want to do a dissertation, you know. And it's like, you know, especially when you, it's time to eat. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, man. You know what I mean? Praise God. Bless the food. Man, I'm starving. You know what I mean? So keep that in mind, all right? But that's the thing. Why don't we look for ways he's working in the world around us rather than working so hard ourselves to prove God's existence to people? Let me say this again. Why don't we look for ways he's working in the world around us rather than working so hard ourselves to prove his existence to people? That, like a praise report. All you have to do is say, hey, I got to share, share a praise report to one of your friends, co-workers. And they'll, they'll get it. God's amazing. Well, what do you mean? And then tell them, you would tell your sister or brother in Christ. And they'll be like, wow, okay. Because God's working all the time. What did Jesus say? My father's working all the time. We don't mean to do this, but we try to create God in our image. And we're small. And then when we do that, we make God look small to the world. And then we wonder why they don't believe. I want to get into the word now. All right? Let's get into the word. Guys, just food for thought, and I appreciate your reception. All right? Go with me to Luke 6. Verses 37 to 42. Luke 6. Verses 37 to 42. This is, this is Jesus teaching about why not having the attitude of judging others. And also why it's such a bad idea. And why we shouldn't do it. 37 reads, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. 
forgive and it will be forgiven to you. Now, the outside world loves to use this scripture to say you shouldn't judge. But when you read further along, you understand what type of judgment Jesus is talking about that we shouldn't use. Because you got to understand something. Like I said a couple sermons ago, we live by faith every day. When you're driving down the street and you press on the brakes to stop, you're putting your faith that the brakes are going to work. When you, when you go on an airplane ride, you're trusting in that pilot not to smash you into a mountain. So we live by faith all the time. Maybe not by faith in God, but we live by faith all the time. And we do the same thing with judging. We judge all the time. We prejudge people all the time based on how they look, how much they weigh, what they wear. We judge people all the time. Don't be fooled to think that people don't judge. So when somebody says that to you, say, what are you talking about, man? You judge, you're judging me right now because of my faith in Jesus Christ. They judge all the time. They judge you for the state, and they, they, they condemn you for the same thing that they, do, that they do themselves. That's why Paul goes on to say that. That's my next scripture I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover. But let's, let's look at this. 38. Give it, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured out into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. What that's saying is, you get what you give. What you put in is how much you're going to get out. You know, especially, you see like a lot of sports guys say it. No it blows my mind about the world. They act like they originated these ideas that have been around for th millennium. They're just changing. They might be said differently. But that's what they say. You get in, what you, you get out what you put in. That's what he's saying. How much you judge and are critical is how much you're going to be judged and criticized. That's what he's saying. Right? That's what he's saying to that same measure. Now, there is a reason why he's saying not to do that, though. Because how much were we forgiven? That's why he made that, he told us that story about the man who had such a debt with the king, and the king was going to put him as a slave, him and his family, and he begged the man, and the, and the king put out his debt. He, he, he canceled his debt. And then he saw some guy that owed him a little bit of money, and he started choking him out. And one of the king's servants saw him and then arranged the king. That's a picture of how much God's forgiven us. So why are you holding on to somebody what they did to you? That's less. That's what he's saying. Now he's talking about a parable. He says he also told them this parable. 39. Can the blind lead the blind? <laughs> Will they not both fall into the pit? The student's not above the teacher, verse 40, but everyone who's fully trained will be like the teacher. And Jesus is our teacher. And the Lord forgives, right? Why do you look at the speck and sawdust in your brother's eye, 41, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? What Jesus is talking about is hypocritical judgment. Now, know what that's like? If I have a drinking problem, I'm going to hire somebody for having a drink. Or if I have a problem with pornography, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make embarrass somebody who's looking at a girl when she walks by. That's what Jesus is talking about. Don't be a hypocritical judge. Don't be judgmental when you have the same problems. In other words, if I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, why are you judging me for the same sin? That's what he's saying. So people always want to look like, well, you can't judge. But everybody makes judgments every day. So let's forget that. That's a child mindset that needs to go away. But here's the thing. Jesus is saying that, why are you judging other people for the same things you're doing? You ever see when somebody says that to you, they call you out, and then you usually get upset, and then they get upset, and you start fighting with one another? But the truth is, why are you judging other people for the same things you're doing? That's what he's saying. First take the speck out of... First take the, 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 the plank out of your eye so you can see clear to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, take care of your own backyard first before you start telling your brother how to take care of his backyard. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, how could you say, he says 42, how could you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, he's saying. Take the plank out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
And that's what people see. People see us being judgmental because they, and they see us being critical, but then they look at us as hypocrites. You understand? And that's why Jesus is saying, don't do that. You're better off saying, hey, yeah, I'm a hypocrite, but so are you. That's what I tell people all the time. Everybody's a hypocrite. You do everything 100% of the time that you say you're going to do? No, none of us do. So this, this, you drop that because it's a childish mindset. See, you understand something. People are looking for reasons not to believe. But you know what the real reason is? Because they don't want to answer to God. It doesn't bode well for them who are encased in a sinful nature, encased in a flesh that controls their every thought, every whim, every desire that's sinful against the holy and righteous God. It doesn't bode well for them to, to want to have to answer to this holy and righteous God. So it's easier for, him, for them not to believe that he exists so they can continue to go on sinning. That's really the truth of the matter. So instead of going along these trying to prove the existence of God, I just recently had a conversation with, with a young guy, and I told him, I said, look, I don't, have to, I don't have to defend what I believe to you. I know it to be true. Because that's what happens. You get in these conversations about, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg. And it's like, you know what the real, you know what the real truth is? You want to call your own shots. You want to be the Lord of your own life. You don't want to have to answer to anyone. That's why you have a problem with authority. Everybody has a problem with authority. Because you're rebellious by nature. That's the truth of the matter. So then why don't we talk about that? If you want to, if you want to really talk about what's real. But they don't want to talk about what's real. They're always trying to deflect. You understand? So what I'm trying to say to you is that's what Jesus would do. He would get to the heart of the matter. And a lot of times, most all the time with Jesus, it froze the people. Or it broke the people. Or it enraged the people. It's the same thing with Paul. Paul was in a riotist evangelism. Every time he preached the gospel, a riot broke out. Why? Because he hit people's nerves. He really incited the crowd because he was talking about things that they didn't want to talk about. It's like that line in A Few Good Men. He says, you know, he, when, he's on the, when Jack Nicholson is on, the, on the, um, the witness stand, he says, deep down inside, you know, you, what we stand for is things that you don't want to talk about at parties. The bottom line is people don't want to talk about things that really are cut to the quick, that are really close to their heart. They want to judge everybody else about what they want to, you know, what they think and say and, and feel. You see it a lot today. The, you have to just love them. Know the truth. Know what it's about. Recognize it so you don't react to it. A lot of times they're just trying to get a reaction out of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and throw you off course. That's what they try, they try to throw you off course. They try to do what the enemy does. They try to derail you. Now, the second teaching I want to go with is, is Romans 2 verses 1 to 3. Romans 2 verses 1 to 3. This is uh, Paul. And the Bible's teaching further along, Jesus is teaching, and why we shouldn't judge others, and how God is the righteous judge. In Romans 2 verses 1 to 3, God's righteous judgment to you, therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment, you do the same things. Verse 2. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do, not, who do such things is based on truth. Because God's the God of truth and righteousness. Verse 3. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, you, you think you will escape God's judgment? How are you going to escape God's judgment unless you don't do those things? And that's the only time you can point other people what they're struggling with. The only time someone's receptive of what you're trying to say to them is when they know you don't do it. Think about it. If they know you live a life that's above reproach, then they'll be willing to listen to you if you say it in a very loving and gentle, kind way. They'll, because they know that well, you don't do it, so you're not a hypocrite. 
And they also know God's a righteous judge. And he's the only one that can judge. But keep in mind, a lot of people don't know this scripture either. Paul said it. We know there's going to be a judgment day. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ points to the one God chose that's going to be the judge. Paul said that. God appointed Jesus to be the judge. And his resurrection proves it. Proves that going to be a, it's going to be a judgment day and proves that, that Jesus is going to be the one to judge. One last scripture. This is Jesus in action, not condemning someone or judging someone who was caught in the act of sinning. You know the scripture very well. John 8, verses 3 to 11. The adulterous woman. The woman that was caught in adultery. The man was caught too. Everybody always remembers the woman, but it was, you know, it takes two to, you know, to tangle, right? John 8, verses 3 to 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they're the Pharisees again, brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, so they were humiliating her. They were embarrassing her. And they were using her, really, just to catch Jesus in a heresy, in, in, in a hypocritical moment. And they said to Jesus, teacher, an Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabboni, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? It's kind of like a question where if he answers it one way, he's going to make himself, if he, if he agrees with the Pharisees and they stone the woman, the people are going to look at him like he's not merciful. That he wasn't a friend of the sinner and was, and was judgmental and not kind and not showing God's love. Which was the opposite of who he was up to this point and continuing on. I mean, they, that's why the sinners love Jesus. Because they never felt condemned or judged by him. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't stone the, the woman and agree with the Pharisees, then he's, go, then he's not following Moses' command. Which is, you can get in trouble for that in this day and age of this time. He was, he was, so it's a, it's a lose lose. It's a lose. It's kind of like, I'll give you a quick example. I remember one time, I used to be really into playing basketball, right? And this, and this older gentleman wanted to play me. This is going back about 15 years. And I was really starting to, I was, Cindy could tell you, I was, I was getting pretty good because I play all the time. That's how I kind of stayed thinner. Um, but I never forget this old gentleman wanted to play me. And the thing is, if, if I play him and he beats me legitimately, how's that make me look? But if I play him and I beat him, how's that make me look? You can't win. It's a lose-lose. And that's exactly the situation that they were trying to put Jesus in. All right? They were using the question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. A lot of people always say, I wonder what he was writing down. But I, I look at that as a picture of the very finger that wrote the law and gave it to Moses. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away at one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And I love that it puts that, the older ones first. Meaning they, they, I guess time really tells who you are. <laughs> like time will tell. Because the older, the older ones knew right away that they weren't without sin. That they had a checkered past. You know, and it's true because young people... God bless them, but they always come out real self-righteous. And no one scares me about younger people today. They, the younger people today are coming up. They're very moral, but they don't believe in God, which is an oxymoron. Because the moral argument is probably one of the greatest arguments for the existence of God. So I noticed that. I mean, God bless them. They're going to figure it out. Just pray for them. 
So they figure out sooner rather than later. Because the, if the young people would have threw that stone down, they would have been ahead of the curve. You know? Jesus straightened up and asked her, and this is big, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. And you know why this is big? Because Jesus is the only one that can condemn. Who gave all judgment to, to the Son of Man? has all authority to judge because God the Father gave Jesus Christ the Son of Man all authority to judge and why did he judge her no did he condemn her no and he's the only one that has righteous enough to, to do so and he didn't so what's that tell us that we should judge and condemn other people we should love them like Jesus and let them experience that love it's only God's love that can really change a life. It's only God's love that can really change someone's life. And I like this, though. He says, Jesus declared that I'm not going to condemn you. But he also says, go now and leave your life of sin. And that's what a lot of people have to realize, too. That's why a lot of people have a hard time with grace. Because it's too easy for them. You mean to tell me? I remember I, had these, I, remember I was talking to these young guys. And I love getting them to the point where they go, you mean to tell me that if a guy murders his family and he's, he's sitting, in, he's sitting in, in death row for 30 years and then they, they execute him, but in that time, he, 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 he repents of his sins, he confesses his sins, and he puts his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, that he's going to heaven, and if a guy next door that lives at my house never bothers his soul, never does anything really wrong, but he doesn't believe in Jesus, he's going to hell. And I say, yeah. And they get nuts. And I love watching them get nuts because the answer is right in front of their face. Salvation isn't because of us. That's why it doesn't matter. That's why the thief on the cross, everything he did put him on the cross. But he said, Lord, remember me. And the Lord said, you'll be with me. In the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with us. That's why that makes sense. The only way that can make sense with that scenario I just gave you is if it doesn't have anything to do with the people involved. It has to do with God and Jesus. That's how that makes sense. And then they got real quiet after I explained that to them. We can't earn salvation. So it doesn't matter how good you are. You're not going to be good enough. When it comes to God, because God's perfect, God's righteous, and God's holy, and he's justified to condemning us. But he didn't condemn us. He sent his son to save us. Thanks be to God. But he has every right to condemn us because we don't, we don't measure up. And see, that's the problem. When you say that to people, their pride can't handle that. They probably can't handle the truth that you can't save yourself. That's why they need to be broken. That's why if you want to pray for the younger generation, you need to pray for them to be broken because they have this self-sufficiency. They have this self-sufficiency that they think they don't need God. But that's not true. So if you really want to pray a prayer, for them to meet God, then you need to pray for the Lord to break them of that pride. That's why, that's why God, God disdains a haughty look. Why? It's prideful. It's pride. God can't stand pride. So that's the problem with the generation today. They don't think they need God. They think God's irrelevant. Imagine that. God created this existence, this reality, created us, and they think the one who created everything doesn't exist or has no relevancy. Think about that for a minute. It's a joke if you think about it. I, la I laughed to myself. I said, I can't believe it. They really believe that. 
They really believe it. That's what they believe. Because their whole thing is necessity. They live in this culture of consumerism, materialism. It's a problematic society. That's why you got to call a guy. You always got to call a guy. And because of that brainwash, they don't think they need God until they need God. And then all of a sudden, they're on their knees crying out to God. That's why God allows bad things to happen, guys. Bad things don't happen because there's good people, because there is no good people. Jesus said there is no righteous. What did he say? Why do you call me good? There is no, no one's good but God. Right then and there, he's saying no one's good. Then the Bible says, no, there is no righteous one, not one. So there is no good, there is no righteous. Bad things happen because there's sin, and God allows that to break people of their pride so they'll come to him. That's why bad things happen. Why do you think, we were just looking at that video, and people get so excited because they get a, they get a box. Did you ever think a little box, shoe box, can change a life, impact a life that greatly? But here, people wouldn't even think nothing of it. Why? Because they have everything. Because I don't need God. What do I need God for? I got a good job. I got a nice car. I got food in the refrigerator. That's why, listen, I don't, want the, I don't want to seem unpatriotic, but that's why I'm not big on the American culture. Because the American culture, as a Christian, is very offensive. As a Christian, this culture is very offensive. Jesus said, in order for you to be my disciple, you, you need to deny yourself. This country is all about self. This culture is very antithesis of the Christian faith. You should be offended. Everybody's always saying, our oh, Christians offend us. I'm offended by America's values. See, I flipped the script on them. Because here's the thing. If rights are going to be equal, they need to be equal for everyone. Or they're not equal for anyone. Everybody wants to talk about equal rights. Let's talk about equal rights. If you got the right to not believe in God, then I got the right to believe in the one true God. That's the way it works in America. That's what our military fought for. I was talking to a young man a couple of days ago. He said you should never talk about religion or politics. That's why this country was started. Newsflash to the planet. America was started because they wanted religious freedoms and they wanted political freedoms, meaning they, they didn't want a church with a pope. Church without a pope. And a, a, a state without a monarch rule. That's why America started. Church and state. That's the facts. And this is why people need to understand what it's really about. And we need to be bold because God's with us. God's for us. And if God is for us, who can stand against us? Let us pray. Father God, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, you are who you say you are. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are God Almighty. Yahweh Elohim. And Father God, we thank you for your Son, our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. We thank you for living in America where we could still proclaim your good news, your gospel good news. And Lord, I pray that this message goes out to the ends of the earth and I pray that it touches every heart that hears it and changes the life for your glory and for your honor, for your praise. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here and I pray that you bless them this week. Bless them as they go in and bless them as they come out. Let no weapon forged against them prosper in Jesus' name. Edge of protection around them. And Lord, use us to be change agents for you. We're here for you. We're here to bring the gospel message to the world. So Lord, please give us the spirit of boldness. To be bold like lions. To go into the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in your mighty name that we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen.